I'm going to talk about something more serious, <laughs> about something also maybe a little bit political, on uh, how this industry can improve its impact on the planet. Thank you for the very nice introduction. As said, I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability and, um, and how the fashion industry can improve on the footprint that we have globally. Sorry, that was one too, too many. The fashion industry globally is the third largest industry. So just to put it clearly, this is an industry that has an enormous impact on the planet and on all of us, both on economy and obviously also on the environmental and social footprint. The turnover of the industry is 450 billion US dollars. But we're the second largest polluting industry. And I think those figures kind of put this industry on the map in a different sense than when we normally talk about the industry where we talk about luxury goods, desirable things, beautiful stuff, aesthetics, genius designers, and all the fun part of it. The serious part of it is this one. Right now, scientists say that we are using about one, half, one and a half of the planet's resources. The predictions say that in 2050, we'll be using what is equivalent to three planets of natural resources. So something has to change. And if the fashion industry is one of the biggest industries and the second largest polluter, it's definitely one of the industries that has to wake up to this reality and look into how we can change. The environment is affected tremendously by the industry. Chemicals led into waters by dyeing and uh, the process of producing garments. The climate is affected on the CO2 level and the use of energy, obviously. People. People in China, where a lot of production is taking place, because we're seeking low-wage uh, places to, to find the production. So we are exploiting human labor globally in China, India, Bangladesh, Africa, but also in southern parts of uh, Europe. The production, obviously, has a tremendous impact also on the environment in different scales. And raw materials. We use a lot of water producing cotton. And cotton is by far, you know, not a very, uh, uh, even though in an organic sense, and not a very environmental uh, growth, because the water use is equivalent, no matter if it's, a, if it's an organic field or if it's a, a conventional cotton field. But we have a vision, at least for the time being, concerned with the Nordic fashion industry, um, a vision to actually make change, to take responsibility and make it into something that the industry can also grow upon. We have an ambition to uh, make the industry come together and take a global leadership on how we can address and tackle some of these global changes. Back in 2008, the Nordic fashion industries came together the Nordic region is Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Iceland. And we performed a platform that we call NICE. And the word NICE is also nice and easy to use, nice fashion, nice people, so on. Um, but the goal is actually what the logo says, that it's a Nordic initiative, clean and ethical. That's the word. And it's a joint commitment from the Nordic fashion industry to take a lead on how we can improve on the social and environmental impact of our industry. But we cannot do this alone. I mean, obviously, even though the fashion industry is pretty big for the Scandinavian region, counting H&M for one of the Scandinavian big corporations, but also Bestseller, who has shops like Vero Moda, Jack and & Jones, and Only in this market. Um, we produce in all over the world. And uh, the fashion companies coming out of the Nordic region cannot tackle these challenges without addressing it in a global scale with guys like you. But it requires a lot of different things to actually approach this agenda on how we can improve the industry's impact. It requires a lot of new skills. New skills being taught in the classrooms of the design schools and business schools, but also new skills for the people already working in the industries. We have to develop new competences. We have to know what to look for 
when a company is approaching a sustainability agenda, obviously they can go in many different directions. And we advise the brands to go in, thank you, <laughs> 15 minutes left, in the directions that they find most, most um, important to them. Is it the social issues? Is it the environmental? What means the most? And then the, we, we help them to try and gain those skills and competences. We need to also look into how we can build up new business models. Because there's such a huge amount of innovation and solutions lying within the field of actually approaching a more sustainable production, design, and so on. We need to look into new materials. And those new materials is often what we find that the designers find the most interesting. Because there's so many exciting things at hand. Milk fiber, for instance, that has a lotion kind of effect on your skin. It could be uh, made out of nail, or it could be fibers made out of crap. And there's so many new things at hand. Even also the more intelligent materials that can solve other problems besides making you look good or feel good. And among the new solutions also lie different things. In the exhibition that we have of the Danish uh, representation in the Inspiration Hall, we brought a few fashion styles. One of them is a black dress. And it's made out of a concept called zero waste. Zero waste means that you cannot throw away any part of the textile. So it, it requires geometric skills from the designer to actually put together a piece of garment where you don't cut off and throw away maybe 30% of the actual fabric. That's also a sustainable solution. Enzymes, for instance, the use of enzymes in production. Esquel, one of the largest corporations uh, within production of fashion, uh, a, a Hong Kong-based company, they use enzymes in their production. It allows them to actually diminish the amount of water, the amount of chemicals in the fabrics that they produce. And they, even, they can even polish the clothes and keep the colors longer using enzymes. Also, the reuse, not thinking that we should use each other's old t-shirts, but having the thread of a t-shirt that might not have ever been sold, instead of it ending up in landfill or being burned, you can actually take the thread, take the actual cotton, and re it into, into a new thread, and then have another garment made out of it. So there's so many new solutions at hand. It's just a matter of putting light to them. But obviously, we cannot do this alone. This is something that requires co-creation between, between especially three parties. One, the industry. We need the fashion designers and the corporations to want to move in this direction. Obviously, none of us is ever going to buy fashion out of saving the world. We are buying fashion because we want to look good, feel sexy, love the color, love the season, whatever. So I'm not kidding myself. But if the designers are taking this on, and if they are able to actually produce crystal ball <laughs> shirts or you know, desirable fashion that is sustainable, then it actually allows us to have a choice. So we need the industry to take a lead. We need the big corporations and the leading companies to lead the way. We also need to do this in collaboration with governments. Governments need us, needs to help us provide the skills for the designers in schools, for the people working in the corporations. They need to help us have systems of collecting um, garments before they are being thrown out. Um, so that they can become a, a part of the re reuse. They need to help us you know, access some of all the new materials and innovation available in the market. But obviously, civil society, you and I, consumers, we play a pivotal role in this. If we, we, de we decide, I mean, most of the time, the consumers will decide the role, the, the role that the market will take. I mean, the money, the market follows the money, and the consumers have the money. And I mean, if we are seeking sustainable fashion and not just turning a blind eye to the fact that this, this industry is a huge polluter and a huge exploiter of human labor, then we won't ever change. But if we are actually starting to look for what we buy, to look at how we use it, what degrees do you wash your clothes on? How many times do you wash it? Vivian Westwood said to me not long ago, why don't we put a care label in the clothes saying, wash every second time? Because maybe we would follow, and it would actually make a difference. So the consumer pays a, a really, really important role in actually making this change. 
in Copenhagen, we've been hosting the Fashion Summits. And the Fashion Summits is a, is a conference where we're trying to gather the entire fashion industry of, uh, uh, of, of the world to discuss every second year how we can move the industry forward. Uh, the last summit was held in May 2012, and I have a little video report on this. Many of the biggest names in fashion and politics are in the Danish capital, Copenhagen, this week for Fashion Summit with a difference. The focus, reducing the impact of the clothing industry on the environment. Our very fashionable Monita Rajpal is there and she joins us now. Hi, Monita. Hi there, Zainia. I think that for the challenge, first and foremost, for the organizers here is to actually define what sustainable fashion is for this industry. You know, the fashion and textile industry is perhaps one of the largest in the world and, unfortunately, one of the largest contributors uh, of pollution in the world. Just moments ago, we heard from Her Royal Highness, uh, the Crown Princess Mary of Denmark, who gave her opening speech uh, here at the summit. She is a patron of the event, and she talked about the challenges that are faced, uh, that brands and companies are facing and have to actually embrace the, 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 the whole concept of sustainable fashion, which means, you know, everything from educating the consumer. You know, you and I, as, as average consumers, we probably don't know how our clothes are made, in what conditions, and what impact that process is actually having on the environment. So that's what this whole summit is all about. And of course, all of that will then culminate in a report that will then be given to the EU uh, Danish, pre uh, sorry, the EU uh, presidency, which Denmark holds right now. And then, of course, then on to the uh, climate change summit in uh, Rio later on this year. Joining me now is the host of this event and is the acclaimed actress, uh, Connie Nielsen. Why was it important for you to be a part of all of this? Well, first of all, I'm Danish and I'm very, very happy that we are hosting the summit uh, again here in Copenhagen. Um, and uh, I, I really want to help sustain any kind of initiative that asks uh, how do we change the processes by which it, we obtain our goods, whether that be in fashion or whether that be for furniture or for any of the goods that we use as normal parts of our lives. As consumers, mm -hmm. I think you, as you just mentioned, we often feel powerless. And I think that if we all get engaged with it as if we're all part of the whole process from the beginning and be by being aware, mm -hmm. by asking that our uh, producers of goods uh, look towards innovation as a way of bringing down the cost of sustainability, but at the same time also as a way of, it's an exciting way of looking mm. at the future. If we can make choices from the beginning that are conscientiously green, that conscientiously want to be clean, then those choices have been shown now to actually end up maybe saving you money as a producer. So it makes business sense, and I think that's the challenge that many over here are looking at in terms of, you know, there's so much more demand now, whether it is here in Europe and North America, but especially in Asia Pacific, there's so much more demand. That is the challenge that how to bring it all together. That's exactly right, and I also believe that at some point we'll have to start having a sort of pricing system that will reflect what is the true cost, not just the dollar cost, but what is the global cost, because maybe my uh, suit was not made here in Denmark, my suit was maybe, parts of it was maybe made in Asia, another part of it was maybe made uh, in Iceland. You just don't know right now in this globalized times, but there is a global cost mm -hmm. to what I'm wearing, and, and I'd like to have that cost included in the price. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much Thank for being so with much. us here on World One. And Zane, just one of those things, I think the main thing that people really want to know about right now, and it's the transparency, and that is going to go into the definition of uh, sustainable fashion. I'll have my sit-down interview uh, with Her Royal Highness, uh, Crown Princess Mary of Denmark, uh, just after I speak to you, Zane. So we'll have that for you tomorrow on World One. Monita Rajpal reporting from Copenhagen. Thanks a lot, Monita. Hi. So at the summit, we had keynote speaks from all over the world. And as, as I said, I think it's super important that we address these issues to, to raise awareness amongst the leading designer brands. So we had the Gucci's and the so on, you know, who are the trendsetters of uh, most of uh, the rest of the fashion world. But also we need the global players, like the bigger corporations, like the Gaps, the H&M, the Patagonias, and so on. So the, the more broad and commercial uh, fashion part of the industry. And um, they all came together in, uh, in Copenhagen, and the next one will be held uh, in, uh, in 2014. We're going to go for another video. Can we turn up the volume yeah, a bit? The Nordic please? Fashion Association, the Danish Fashion Institute. I would like to welcome you all to Copenhagen and to Copenhagen Fashion Summit.
2012. Because in the end we are left with the fact that there is no alternative. I believe everything happens for a reason, but at the same time we can be the reason why things happen. We are aware that CSR and sustainability are not a finishing point, but it is a journey, and I would say it is a non-return journey. So what would sustainability 4.0 look like? Well, the answer is you wouldn't need it, because sustainability would be fully integrated into all business practices. It would simply be the way business Basically, that's what it's about. It's about paying for the things that we never, ever paid for. For the river that didn't send us an invoice, for the forest that didn't send us a bill. It's about that. I don't want them to feel guilty about that. I think we need to act together. The power of global citizens and consumers to turn eco fashion into simply fashion. In our globalized world, there is no doubt collective action is needed to address these challenges. You can help us making unsustainable production and consumption old fashioned. I think the, the fashion industry holds a big responsibility within that because we can communicate to consumers and we can actually make them change their minds. If you want to join us in our mission, you can go online to the CopenhagenFashionSummit.com and follow the five steps and become part of our nice group of people who all want to you know, promote the issues on sustainability. And if you want to view all the keynotes in full length, they're also present at the, on the website. I see a lot of young faces and I assume also that the BODW is attracting a lot of students from the design schools and we also emphasize a lot on how we can raise this awareness amongst the you guys who are the next generation. And therefore, as part of the Fashion Summit in Copenhagen, we also host a youth summit. And we gathered uh, students from 16 European design schools and business schools, and they were working together, presenting seven demands coming from the youth to the industry. And uh, it was a super interesting uh, point of view also to raise in that sense. And it would be highly interesting to include some of the Hong Kong design schools uh, for the next summit back uh, or in uh, 2014. Apart from that, also I think fashion, of course, is also about showing, showing what sustainable fashion can look like. So we were challenging also designers from uh, the Nordic region to work in new, innovative, and sustainable materials, and it was presented at a, at a runway show. And we keep collecting garments, so if you hear about fashion designers here in the region that works sustainably, and, uh, and has an interest in this field. You know, we're very interested in learning about them because we are collecting and preparing like a library of, uh, of fashion that we can present globally. So we're already touring with fashion shows and exhibitions presenting how the sustainable fashion can also look like and be equally sexy, desirable and everything as all the other fashion that we know. So the next fashion summit will be in spring 2014 and I hope we can all welcome you to join us there. Um, I think our mission, if I'm to say, if I have to say it's short and maybe a little bit tacky, is that we want to save, be saving the planet in style. Um, and uh, hopefully we won't be the only ones, you know, acclaiming this mission, because uh, this is definitely a task that no one, none of us can do alone. Now we have to work in networks and we have to join forces uh, on this mission. But for me, it's like the most important thing. I was in an interview session earlier this morning, and, and I came to think of that uh, if I'm to be awake at night, work my ass off, sorry the language, um, it has to be for some bigger purpose. I mean, I'm happy about the fashion weeks, and I'm happy about all the glamour and all the fun side of the industry, but uh, thinking of the impact that this industry has on our planet and on people makes me realize that this is uh, by far something that we can do better than what we're doing at the moment. Uh, and that's what makes my heart tick. And it, that's what makes me you know, feel that this industry is important. Also, I think that the fact that this industry is such a strong communication tool, it can reach out to each, and each of us. You know, it can even make our change our minds if we like the length or the color or the mood or something of a season. And I'm sure it can make us change our minds into also thinking 
that ha acting with a consciousness to the fact of the responsibility we have as citizens in a globalized world can become trendy, hip, or something you know, like a, a no-brainer. That we have to give a conscious choice to what we buy and how we use it. We have to think of how much we turn on the water or turn on the light or start the car. Or, you know, it, the conscious consumer could be a cause for the fashion industry to take on. And I'm sure we could make it into something that wouldn't be like the politicians would make it into something boring and dogmatic, but something fun, sexy, and even full of solutions. So I, I really hope that we, can, uh, that we can make an effort together in improving on this. My next slide <laughs> is, however, something completely different. Because <laughs> this is not about sustainability. This is about fun and, and you know, celebrating uh, the fashion industry and celebrating the fact that uh, Denmark is the partner country of uh, BODW and that uh, we have met the Hong Kong Fashion Designers Association and the Hong Kong Fashion Designers because on Sunday, you're all invited to the world's greatest catwalk on the Avenue of Stars, Hong Kong Fashion Designers Association, my colleagues, and the Danish Fashion Institute will present to you the world's longest catwalk ever. It's a 3.2 kilometer catwalk. It's a public show, you're all invited. It's gonna take place at 2.30 p.m. We will be presenting more than 350 models Danish fashion, Hong Kong fashion, and just a grand explosion of a, of a, of a fest, of a, what do you call it, a celebration of fashion, the, the finale of the, of the Hong Kong uh, design year 2012, and obviously also the finale of uh, the BODW 2012. And uh, we look very much forward to seeing you all there. Right? <laughs> Kevin and Janet? So that's actually all for me. Um, please log on to our website and everything for further. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. I do have actually one question. You do? Yes. You, talked, you spoke of uh, collaboration between industry and governments, etc. Yeah. Um, I mean, Hong Kong government is still at its infancy in looking at sustainability in, in the industry. Could you elaborate a bit more on how the Nordic governments, or particularly the Danish government, has contributed to assisting industry in achieving those goals? I think, for one thing, it supported us financially. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, in what way? And that's, I think, we, we, need, we need money, for instance, to build educational schemes mm -hmm. that will mm -hmm. allow us to support people who are already working in the industries mm -hmm. to achieve knowledge. Are there anything like tax, tax relief for industry as well, perhaps? Um, I don't know if, they, if, if that's something that exists in Denmark, but, they, but the, uh -huh. we've, we've built our own educational schemes in collaboration mm -hmm. with the traditional educations mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and universities, but mm -hmm. also to provide knowledge accessibly and not too affordably because we're looking at the industry in Denmark consists of a lot of small and medium-sized corporations. Yes, yes, yes. They don't have a CSR department in-house no. or a sustainability department. Mm -hmm. So they will need to have this kind of knowledge implemented into the minds of the people already working in production or design or marketing mm -hmm. or some other mm -hmm. kinds of the business. So we need, we need to feed them new knowledge. We need right. to educate them in order for them to be able to... It's a state of mind, to, isn't it? It's a state of mind, but it's also a lot of, it's a, it's a lot of hands-on knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it can become really intellectual and, and you know, high-flying to mm -hmm. talk about sustainability and all this, but I think a lot of it is to get your hands onto it. Right. Okay. And I think for a, it, it's like swallowing an elephant. You would have to <laughs> cut it up <laughs> in little pieces and start yes, by it, one end. It's a progressive thing, I think yeah. that's, that's what you're trying to say here. Yeah. Right. Anybody? Um, I saw that H&M was um, part of the summit last, um, last year. So w what exactly like, did they agree that they're going to do for the environment? Or like, not even just H&M, maybe like, what did Gucci like, agree to do? Like Two papers came out of the summit. One is that UN allowed us to create the first sector-specific, like a business-specific code of conduct under the UN Global Compact Program. They have this code of conduct program under UN called Global Compact. It's 10 principles on corruption and climate and different things, human rights and stuff. So we did one that is a 16 principle code. 
including you know, ethics about models, for instance, or water, or chemicals, and so on. And this is being implemented right now in the UN system and will probably by the end of this year be you know, officially what you sign up to as a fashion industry when signing up to Global Compact. That was one thing. Another paper that the industry came together upon was a recommendation for the EU, uh, the European Union, on uh, how to approach consumers, how we can engage consumers in this agenda. Because consumers play a really important role, both in the way we use fashion, but also in raising awareness amongst consumers on what to buy. And this was uh, a joint venture be between the industries. Apart from that, um, some of the large corporations like H&M, Gap, Patagonia, Nike, Adidas, a group of companies, I think there are about 40 of them in a collaboration called Sustainable Apparel Coalition. They've come together to produce a sustainable index, including things like what Connie Nielsen was speaking about. How can we measure the impact? And hopefully, I mean, we are working towards having a hang tag on, on clothes, so you would have the price in dollars, but you could also measure the, pl the price in water, maybe in CO2, maybe in chemicals or environmental impact. It's a difficult calculation, but clever people who are not, not my kind, but a, a really clever kind of people um, are working on right now looking into how we can measure. Because I think that would be a super strong tool. I mean, also for us as consumers, that we could actually see what we're buying and what impact it probably had on the environment. My question was about cross-disciplinary approach um, of the Lens Design Center, because you're, you're also part of this uh, cross-design dynamics that Nina you was speaking about this morning. And how are you going to approach, because that's also the issues of the furniture industry. I mean, I was talking to Fred Hansen, CEO, and everybody's in the same mood, I would say. And not just in terms of education, but innovation and, uh, and quality of life. How do you see these crossovers? Because fashion, I, I mean, I take a brand like uh, Acne or H&M now is doing some furniture, of course. Um, how do you see the evolution and this crossover? Of cross-disciplinary. Uh, cross-disciplinary, yes. Yeah. Well, I, we see a lot of that happening, but in, especially in materials. I think in material innovation, there's a lot of crossover. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot to learn uh, in between the industries. And I hope also fashion designers will approach, you know, different aspects of design. It's been more the other design disciplines looking at fashion and wanting co to collaborate that way. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of more collapse in, also in other businesses apart from, from those who are already working in the creative atmosphere, um, but also you know, more traditional, more technical and so on. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Sorry? Uh, just that sometimes solution or innovation would emerge perhaps oh, from, sure. from, from other disciplines Often to impact on fashion, yeah. I would say. Sometimes, I mean, it's, it's also, the, you know, when, whenever you narrow in a field, and I, like, for instance, the designer David Anderson who's done the zero waste dress, to have you know, your field narrowed and say, okay, I have to use all bits of this fabric, it allows you to, pro to provide a completely different design than you would have done normally. And in the same sense, I mean, meeting with people from the technical side or with clean tech or with, you know, with different kinds of industries allows you to think differently and will, will challenge the way you work. And I think we've seen a lot of, uh, of interesting you know, products coming out of it. None really at the moment who's in a broad commercial sense, but, but things that will maybe eventually come out. So my last question would be, uh, what's your difference? How would you perceive the difference between textile and fashion? The textiles is, you know, is, is, is the core part of the fashion industry, obviously. Um, we work a lot with the fashion designers, less with the textile manufacturers. But I think the textile manufacturers, especially in the, in the, in the sustainability agenda, is you know, one of the key, key elements. So, so we definitely need to attack the textile industry a lot more on this in order to be able to improve in, in this field. Okay, I think that's the time we all have today. Thank you very much, Eva. See you on Sunday. Thank you. 2.30. Don't miss it. <laughs> Thank you very much.